I want to begin by first uh, greeting those of you at both our South Street campus and our North Aurora campuses. Uh, if you're at South Street, I hope for, we'll see you at one of our Holy Week communion services at our Kessinger campus on Thursday or Friday evening. And if you're at North Aurora, hope you'll join Pastor Andrew at your services also on Thursday and Friday evening. These Holy Week services are certainly a high point in our church family life and important for all of us. We look forward to seeing you there. Well, I want to begin today with a Jeopardy-style quiz. Everybody knows how to play Jeopardy, right? <laughs> I apologize for this. Um, so I'm going to give you a category, and I'm going to give you um, an answer, and then you respond with a question. And just say it out loud. We're all friends here, so you can do that. The category for our quiz show is Great Kings from History. You're going to wish you spent more time studying for your world history class. Great kings from history. I'll give you a description of a particular king, and then you give the answer in the form of a question. Who was so-and-so? All right, you got that? All right, question number one. He was king of Great Britain during the American Revolution. Answer, who was King George III? The Declaration of Independence is actually addressed to him. Question number two, he ruled as king of France and was married to Marie Antoinette. <laughs> Crickets. Who was King Louis XVI, who, by the way, was executed during the French Revolution in 1793. I don't think it went any better for Marie either. Question number three, although accomplished, an accomplished king in his own right, he is best known as the father of Alexander the Great. Now, this is a hard one. Who was? Good. King Philip II of Macedonia. I heard it over there. Very good. And is there one more? Oh, no. Two more. Question number four. This king's heroic leadership in the Battle of Thermopylae in 480 BC made him a legend. You guys should know this. The movie was made about him called 300. Who was? King Leonidas of the Spartans. And by the way, I know there's some sad Michigan State fans out there. So my condolences. And the last question, number five, all of you know this, he is forever known as the king of rock and roll. Who was Elvis? Elvis' first appearance in a sermon in some time. We've, we've missed him. So we're in the sixth part of a series we're calling Unrecognized King. And for five weeks now, we've been looking in John's gospel at stories where Jesus makes a statement about himself and then performs a miraculous sign or miracle uh, to demonstrate his authority to make that particular statement. And then we see that some believe and some don't. Many do not believe. They fail to recognize him as who he says he is. In John 6, remember, he feeds the 5,000 and says, I am the bread of life. In John 9, he heals a man born blind and says, I am the light of the world. In John 10, he says, I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. In John 11, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead and says, I am the resurrection and the life. And last week in John 2, we saw Jesus cleanse the temple, threw out the money changers and those selling animals and said, in effect, I am the true temple. Now this week, we're gonna look at a story that appears in all four of the gospel accounts and is traditionally called the triumphal entry and is celebrated by Christians all over the world as Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week. Now, the story does appear in John's Gospel, chapter 12, but we're going to jump to Luke today because there's a couple of things in the way Luke tells this story that I want us to see. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 19, and I'm going to read the whole story through, and then we're going to talk our way through it. Luke 19, beginning of verse 28. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. Now, Jesus has been teaching and healing in the region of Jericho, some 15 miles northeast of Jerusalem. The Passover feast is just a week or so away, so Jesus and his disciples are on their way to Jerusalem. Verse 29, as he approached Bethpage and Bethany, these are two little villages, sort of like suburbs of Jerusalem. Bethany was where Mary, Martha, and Lazarus lived, you might remember, and where the resurrection of Lazarus had taken place in just recent days. At the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it, say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. 
They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, and I had mentioned last week that the road from Jericho went up to Jerusalem, uh, now we see him going down. That's because he had to cross a ridge called the Mount of Olives, and it head down toward the city, uh, the, Val the Kidron Valley, to Jerusalem. The whole crowd of his disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. We're going to look at three things this morning. The coming of the king, the worship of the king, and then the tears of the king. First, the coming of the king. Now, we all living in our culture recognize uh, signals or certain protocols that tell us when we're in the presence of someone significant or important. For example, at a wedding, what does everyone do as the bride walks down the aisle? This is a picture of uh, my son's wedding in Nashville last summer. When the bride walks down the aisle, everyone stands up because she's the most important person in the room. Or when a president of the United States walks into a room, everyone also stands, and sometimes a military band will play Hail to the Chief because he's the most important person in the room. Uh, when movie stars arrive for the Oscars, they come in limousines and they walk the red carpet because we value their importance as a culture. All these are cultural or historical clues that tell us something about the status or importance of a certain person. And in this story, uh, there are several cultural symbols that we can miss because we, we weren't raised in that culture, uh, but they would have been obvious to the people of the time. And first, interestingly enough, is a donkey of all things. Luke says in verse 28, after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there. Now other gospel writers indicate this is a young donkey, which no one has ever ridden, untie it and bring it here. Now this is the only time in the gospel accounts that we are clearly told that Jesus ever rides an animal horse or donkey or anything. He always walks. The obvious question is, why does Jesus need a donkey here? Uh, the walk to Jerusalem from where he is is only about a mile and a half. And Jesus spent his whole life walking. He routinely walked 10 to 20 miles a day, which if you're a step counter, any step counters here? Anybody? I count steps. That's 10,000 or 20,000 steps a day. So why does he need a donkey to just go that distance, like me uh, calling an Uber to go to my mailbox. Why does he do it? Verse 31, if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. So notice Jesus not only needs a donkey, he needs a particular kind of donkey. He wants a colt, meaning a young donkey, one that's never been ridden before. The first thing he's doing here is he's reenacting or he's fulfilling an ancient prophecy. In the prophet Zechariah, we read, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, Jesus knew that prophecy. Most every Jewish person knew that prophecy. Jesus is making a very clear and striking statement about himself. Now, as we've seen uh, in the last few weeks, he's been making increasingly provocative statements about himself as if he's intentionally poking his enemies and detractors. When he said, I am the bread of life, John tells us they grumbled against him. When he said, I am the light of the world, they said, well, he's a sinner. When he said, I am the good shepherd, they said, well, he must be demon-possessed. 
When he said, I am the resurrection and the life, Caiaphas said, it's better for one man to die than for the whole nation to perish. In other words, this man must die. And here he rides a young donkey in fulfillment of an ancient messianic prophecy. He's saying in no uncertain terms, in symbolic terms, I am the king that has been promised. And this ultimately is the very reason he would be put to death. The sign over his head as Jesus hung on the cross said, Jesus, king of the Jews. The people of Jerusalem would have recognized it immediately. Uh, This was what a king was to do. This is sort of a coronation parade. Now, just a couple of things about the donkey. Luke says it's a colt, a young donkey, never ridden before. Now, the meaning of this is that the donkey is, is somehow holy or set apart for a special purpose, that no one is to ride it until the king rides it. This is a tradition stretching all the way back to King David in the Old Testament. And then another small thing that, I don't know how big a thing it is, but I just noticed this. Uh, If you've never ridden a donkey before, uh, and most of us have not, we wouldn't understand this, but Jesus takes an unbroken, untrained animal into a shouting, chaotic crowd, and what would we expect would happen to that donkey? You would expect that it would it would freak out. It would buck and bray and be out of control, but it doesn't do any of those things. Maybe it's because Jesus doesn't need to break or train the donkey. Even the donkey, an animal, obeys and serves him. The donkey is also a symbol of humility. In ancient Roman culture, when a a general or an emperor, someone of great importance, would come into a city victorious, he would ride a white horse or white stallion that befit his status as a general or a, or a king, uh, but not a donkey. A donkey was a symbol of great humility. And in the book of Revelation, as Anton referenced earlier, we see this apocalyptic image that when Jesus comes again a second time to establish his eternal kingdom, he will come as a victorious king riding a white horse. Revelation 19 says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called faithful and true. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. On his robe and on his thigh he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But not this time. This time he comes in humility and peace, riding on a donkey. Next we see that Jesus is claiming a a unique kind of authority. If he says, if anyone asks you, why are you untying the colt, just say, the Lord needs it. This would be like me sending my, one of my sons to a car lot and saying, hey, just go get a car, and if the dealer asks you, why are you taking that car, just say, the dad needs it, right? <laughs> there are only two ways this could work. Either the title, Lord, is an acknowledgement of divine authority, and Jesus applies it to himself, or his name inspired such devotion that people would let him have anything he needed. Now, this is taking place in a region where Jesus had many friends, Mary, Martha, Lazarus, where Lazarus was raised from the dead. And I could imagine that many, many people have told him, hey, Lord, if you need anything, if you ever need anything at all, just ask, and it's yours. And that makes me ask a question. How willing, how willing am I to surrender something to Jesus that I usually think of as mine? You know, my time, my resources, my stuff, So Jesus rides into Jerusalem with an unmistakable intent. He is fulfilling an ancient prophecy. With an unmistakable authority, he's the promised king. And with an unmistakable humility, he's a different kind of king. And the next cultural symbol is in verse 35. It says, they brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. Other gospel writers include the detail of waving palm branches, and these were highly symbolic. They throw their cloaks on the ground because in the ancient world, this was a sign of honor and respect, not unlike our tradition of the red carpet treatment. In other words, people got it. They recognized the symbols. They recognized his authority. They recognized the fulfillment of prophecy. They recognized this was the coming of a king. And that leads us to the second point we see here, and that's the worship of a king. The worship of a king. Do you know what a mononymous celebrity is? Not monotonous, mononymous. Someone so famous, they only need one name, all right? 
Um, here are a few, for example. Everybody? Oprah, Oprah or LeBron or who? Le- no, LeBron. Or maybe, oh, this is my favorite, Clint. What a face, right? You gotta love that face. Or for those born after the Paleolithic era, names like Adele, I don't have a picture of her, or Usher, and of course, Flo. Now, Flo by now is kind of a family member for all of us. But now, if one of these one name celebrities, let's just say Oprah or LeBron, uh, came to Chapel Street this morning, walked in the back and came into one of our services, what would happen to the whole morning? Right? The whole morning would just tip in their direction, right? Most of you would have trouble listening to anything else said up here if that happened. I'd have trouble listening to what I was saying because we'd be so aware there was someone famous in the room. But that's because we've become a celebrity-driven culture. We're a celebrity-worshiping culture. And in a way, that's kind of what's happening here. Verse 37, when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Now, right here, this, I think, is a tipping point in the story of Jesus. There are several, but this is a a major tipping point. The narrative has been heading this way for weeks that we've seen. Jesus has been saying and doing things that have created controversy. An increasing tension is in the air. We see three things going on in this little part of the story. First, the crowd is praising Jesus. He's riding on this donkey, fulfilling ancient prophecy, but if you look closely, they're praising him for the wrong things. Luke says, the whole crowd of disciples began to praise God in loud voices for the miracles they had seen. The feeding of the 5,000, the healing of a man born blind, the raising of Lazarus, and there were several others that Luke mentions in his gospel. Now, there's nothing wrong with praising Jesus for miraculous works, but praising Jesus for his miraculous works without recognizing what they mean and what they say about Jesus is to kind of miss the point. They recognize the fulfillment of prophecy. They recognize Jesus as a coming king, the Messiah, and they're singing part of Psalm 118. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Other gospels use the word Hosanna, which means save us. But what they're thinking is that Jesus is a king in the mold of King David. That is, one who will use his power his authority, his military might to deliver them from their oppressors, the Romans, and lead them back to prosperity as a nation. Secondly, we see that the Pharisees are outraged. They're outraged. They've been increasingly hostile toward Jesus each step of the way with the things he's said and done, but this to them is sort of the final straw. It's a bridge too far. They see clearly what he's doing. They know he's reenacting the prophecies and he's not their idea of what a king should be or what a king is or what the Messiah would be like. He hangs out with the wrong kind of people, tax collectors, sinful women. He does the wrong kinds of things. He heals on the Sabbath, breaking their Sabbath laws. He's confronted their hypocrisy quite strongly. He called them lousy shepherds, In John 10, thieves and robbers, he reiterated that when he cleansed the temple. You've turned my house into a house of thieves. And now he commits, what is to them, blasphemy by allowing people to praise and worship him in a way that belongs only to God himself. So they confront him. Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Tell them to knock it off. It's inappropriate. It's wrong. The third thing we see is that Jesus responds by not only accepting the praise and worship that is due only to God, but he doubles down on it. If they keep quiet, he says, the very stones will cry out. Now here's a thought. 
Jesus is most likely speaking in a metaphor here. He's speaking, speaking metaphorically about stones crying out in worship. But, but what if, just what if he's speaking literally? What if his own glory is so great that even something as dense and inanimate as a stone would cry out in praise? Listen to Psalm 96. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth rejoice. Be glad. Let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let all the trees of the forest sing for joy. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord. What if creation itself, trees, rivers, oceans, mountains, rocks, will one day cry out in worship? I wonder if you've ever seen the Grand Canyon. What we need to see here is that this moment in this story is where Jesus, in a way, seals his fate. The whole story tips toward the cross. And this is where we come to the third part of the story today, and that is the tears of the king. Luke 19, verse 41. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. I'm going to pause there for a moment. This is the second time we've seen Jesus weep. The first, of course, was back in John chapter 11 with the raising of Lazarus. When he stood before the tomb of his friend Lazarus, the Bible said Jesus wept. And the word used there meant to weep silently, with tears, but to weep silently. That's not the word that's used here, that Luke uses. The word Luke uses here means to weep aloud. It means a kind of uncontrollable, audible grief, a wailing, if you will. And this is a jarring scene. In a way, it makes no sense at all. This is a great crowd lining the street. They're jubilant. They're cheering. They're singing. They're celebrating. It's a parade for the king. And Jesus can't control his sorrow. He's weeping openly. What's going on? Verse 42. And he said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, But now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. So why does Jesus weep? Well, he weeps, first of all, because of his love. His grief is born of his love. Remember in John 11, when he weeps at the tomb of Lazarus and all his friends, the people standing around say, look, look, see how he loved him. Jesus weeps because he loves. He loves the people of Jerusalem. He loves those lying in the streets cheering him, even if for the wrong reasons. He loves those who are already planning to kill him, and he loves you. He loves you. Years ago, I baptized a woman who had lived a very hard life, full of pain and brokenness and failure, addiction and sins. And in part of her faith story, she said, I always just assumed God hated me, she said. She said, I'd never heard that he loved me. If you ever wonder how Jesus feels about you, Look at this story. He weeps out of love for the salvation of your soul. Second, Jesus is weeping because he knows the day is coming when Jerusalem will be destroyed. History tells us that the Jerusalem was destroyed, sacked in 70 AD by the Romans under Emperor Vespasian, and the temple mostly destroyed. He's weeping because the crowds do not know who he is and what he's come to do. They want a king who will defeat their enemies, who will liberate them from the Romans, who will be their political hero, a king who will provide them with success, with freedom, with economic prosperity, but he's come to do something else. He's come not to deliver them from the Romans, but to deliver them from sin and death, to establish a new kingdom, not a kingdom just for Israel, but a kingdom that it will include all nations and all people. 
He weeps because, because they have not recognized the time of God's coming to them. This makes me ask another question, which is, what do I want from Jesus? What do I expect from him? Do I see him as my own personal you know, genie in a bottle, my own little good luck charm to make sure things go well for me, that I'm comfortable? Do I see him as my king? Does, does he serve me or do I serve him? And finally, Jesus is weeping because he knows the plan is already underway to arrest him and to put him to death. But make no mistake, Jesus has been intentionally orchestrating these events that he knows will lead to his arrest, his trial, and his death. Remember what he said in John 10. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down and the authority to take it up again. He's weeping because he knows sin and death are waiting at the cross. He weeps not because he's going to the cross, but because the cross is necessary. And we're going to remember the cross this week at all our Holy Week communion services. So I want to close with just a few questions. First is, is Jesus king? Not just is he famous. Is he a famous person from history? Is he a kind of religious celebrity? But does all authority in heaven and earth belong to him? Is he king? And if he is king, what kind of king is he? Is he a king that promises us political power or promises personal prosperity? Or is he a king who weeps over the condition of our souls out of love for us? And finally, is he your king today? Is he your king? Is he my king? Have you recognized the time of God's coming to you? Let's bow in prayer as we close. Lord, we thank you for your word today. And Lord, everyone has a king. Maybe not call it king, but we all worship and serve someone or something. Might be career, might be wealth, might be success, might be comfort. So many things that demand our allegiance and our devotion. But today, we worship you as king. You are the king who came to serve and to save. You are the king who forgives our sin. You are the king who promises life. And so today, we invite you to be the king who rules in our hearts, in our homes, and in this, your church. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Thank you, Anton and worship team. Just before the benediction, remind you that our Holy Week communion here at Kesslinger is at 6 p.m. Thursday and then Friday at 5 p.m. and 7 p.m. Then our Easter celebrations and worship begin Saturday evening at 5 p.m. here at this campus and then continue Sunday morning. We hope we'll see you then. Receive now the benediction. And we go now in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the King who came in humility, the King who came to save, and the King who is coming again in great glory. Amen.